We're not live on YouTube. We are live on a website. All righty. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I first want to acknowledge and thank Commissioner Doris for thanking us from the department, uh, for joining us from the Department of Small Business Services. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I'm delighted to uh, once again be joined by Commissioner Doris and a team of agency leaders who are coming up shortly in the program waiting to provide expert answers to your questions. Commissioner, I thank you and your staff for your assistance in setting up this very important town hall meeting today, which I hope will bring clarity and specific answers to what has been a confusing and difficult process for our business owners. We did our best to identify and bring you agency reps today from agencies and areas that impact your business if you're watching today. Over the past year, it has been challenging for retail and our local businesses. The loss of foot traffic in our commercial corridors has been particularly very difficult. The impact of COVID-19 to our health and the economy has also been significant. More than 7,500 Queens residents have passed on and the challenge from COVID-19 continues and our prayers are with them and their families. However, Queens residents have been resilient in coping with COVID-19 and then the economic crisis, which resulted in so many of our hardworking residents losing their jobs. I promise to do everything I can to address the challenges we face and the disparities in our communities. As of now, Queens unemployment rate hovers somewhere around 10.7% as of December, 2020. That's down from a high of 21.6% in June, 20. 2020, but still 7.7 percentage points higher than the February 2020's pre-pandemic low of 3%. A $1.9 trillion stimulus package has been, I believe, will be, is set to be signed into law by President Biden just in time to prevent a lapse in unemployment insurance for those unemployed due to COVID-19. Additional relief will come for families, education, child tax credit, FEMA emergency funds, and the shelter system. $350 billion will go to state, cities, and tribal governments. And I want to thank Senator Chuck Schumer uh, for his leadership. A new program for restaurants and bars allocates $25 billion with a capital B in pandemic assistance grants. The grants can provide up to $10 million per company with a limit of $5 million per physical location and used to cover payroll, rent, utilities, and other expenses. The Paycheck Protection Program will receive an additional 7.25 billion and more nonprofits will now be allowed to apply for forgiveness loans to help cover payroll and other expenses. My office began a virtual recruitment fair, which we are continuing as well. We now host a monthly jobs recruitment fair on the third Thursday of each month at 2 p.m to address the employment needs of our borough. And I wanna thank Sharon Anderson for her leadership here. As you know, my office has also worked with James Patchett, the president of the New York City EDC to establish the Queen Small Business Grants Program, which provides up to $20,000 to small businesses and vendors who meet the qualifications. Today, the program has received 813 applications with 50% of those application of those applicants receiving approvals at an average rate of about $19,127. However, our agenda today is to offer you the opportunity to learn of resources available to you at New York City Small Business Services. Additionally, our team has uh, agency reps from New York City Department of Transportation, SBS, FDNY, uh, DCWP and the Department of Health and the sheriff who will do their best to address your concerns. I think this is the first time I've ever had a sheriff uh, in my lifetime, in my governmental lifetime at a town hall. So thank you for being here, Sheriff. <laughs> uh, please enter your questions in the Q&A and we will follow up shortly. Next up, we'll hear from our commissioner before a presentation on SBS resources from our presenter, Meredith Weber. 
which will be followed by introductions of agency reps, then Q&A. Now I would like to introduce my friend and colleague in government who's been extremely busy. I feel like every time I turn on the news uh, at the mayor's uh, live town halls, I, saw, I see you or hear you. Saw you yesterday, I think, on here talking about all the great work you're doing to try to get uh, businesses back on their footing uh, as we go through this pandemic. So I wanna thank you for being here, Commissioner. I also wanna acknowledge we're joined by our Deputy Borough President, Rhonda Benda. If you don't know her, get to know her. And also once again, Sharon Anderson, who's our Director of Economic Development and so much more. So thank you, Commissioner, take it away. Well, thank you so much, uh, our Borough President, uh, my Borough President, I'm a Queens resident. Uh, and I'm so happy to uh, be on again with you and your team. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, in helping to bring us all together uh, to make sure that we do all we can to support our small businesses uh, in the city of New York. Uh, at SBS, we're supporting small businesses by doing many things. Um, some of what we have embarked upon uh, is to, uh, first of all, uh, give in-demand services to small businesses uh, to recover from this pandemic. Um, our advocacy for small businesses also on the state and the city and the federal level. Um, in which we are very excited about this new uh, plan that's coming out, the new stimulus package that's also helping small businesses, um, and also our advocacy on the previous PPP program in the way that it was constructed, making sure that it's mainly uh, set up for small businesses. Uh, before it was going, you know, small businesses were competing with uh, larger businesses, 500 employees or less. Recently, they had capped it to 20 employees. Uh, and it's great for our small businesses with 65% of the city small businesses are five employees or less. And so we're very excited about uh, what's happening on a federal level and look forward to supporting our small businesses uh, who are seeking help. For instance, with the, uh, the restaurant recovery program as well, those grants are going to be uh, so necessary for our small businesses and our restaurants who've been devastated by this pandemic. And we're going to help them uh, get those. Uh, SBS uh, has provided 110,000 services to small businesses. Uh, 5,000 plus small businesses received $135 million through our work. Um, we also have our hotline. Hopefully many of you uh, know about our hotline um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the city, which we've set up back in, I believe in June when we started to reopen. Uh, we've got 55,000 calls to that hotline of businesses calling, asking for support and receiving it. Um, and that hotline is 888-SBS4NYC. We'll make sure we put it in the chat and folks know where to go. Uh, but also our webinars like this one and others that we've been training uh, small businesses. We've reached 50,000 uh, individuals and participants, uh, participants on those webinars uh, recently. And so we're very excited about that. Also provided virtual consultations, uh, particularly for our restaurants. If you know what the rules are, what we need to do, et cetera, it's very important that we uh, you know, show our restaurants what they need to do in order to stay compliant. And we've done about 335 of those. I've been around uh, Queens in particular uh, quite a bit, walking the corridors. Uh, we were just out in Flushing uh, last week. Uh, we will continue uh, to go from corridor to corridor uh, across the city, but particularly in Queens, uh, making sure that small businesses know what the rules and regulations are and how we can be supportive. Uh, you know, we've also pushed out, uh, you know, five grant programs, two loan programs during this pandemic, um, and it's not over there. We expect to do much more. The mayor proposed in the state of the city that we have a tax rebate program, uh, which is up in Albany now waiting for approval. Uh, also, an additional uh, loan fund that we're going to roll out once the stimulus dollars get to the city, and also cutting red tape. Uh, making sure that we're making New York City the easiest place to start and grow your business. Um, and Maryland is going to talk a little bit about our business solution centers, our fair share campaign for our PPP program. And by the way, uh, I'm so happy that 70% of those we're helping are in the outer boroughs in that particular program. Um, and also the curtains up program for the shuttered venue operators. I mean, so much going on. Train your employees program, no cost, free online help to help you with the bridge the digital divide for your employees and help small businesses that way. Uh, we partner with so many like Deloitte and others. We have three mentorship programs we recently released in, in January uh, and the list goes on. 
So I just want to say that, you know, SBS is here for you as a small business. We are very much appreciative to join with the borough president uh, to do uh, this particular event here today. Uh, Mary Weber, as mentioned, our executive director for community outreach and operations will be giving a presentation that highlights some of our programs. And we're again grateful to our city agency partners, DCWP, FDNY, uh, DOHMH and DOT and the Sheriff's Office and all city employees who are on today for their support. So thank you, Bar President Richards, uh, for partnering with SBS uh, to help us organize this event here. Um, look, we're gonna build our city back community by community, block by block, small business by small business. Our economic recovery has to come from the ground up. And I wanna just thank you again for uh, all the work that you're doing, uh, Mr. Borough President, back to you. Thank you. I think we're going to your person now, Meredith. Okay, hi, Meredith, good morning. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really great to be here. Thank you, Commissioner Doris and um, Borough President Richards for having us and for your leadership. Um, I am joined by my colleague, Berth Ambrose, who will also talk about um, one of our really, really great services um, in uh, compliance advisors. So um, as the commissioner mentioned, I'll walk through a few of the top line um, guidelines to know about, um, go through a bunch of the very many resources we have available to help for free. Um, and then uh, after my presentation, I'll drop a lot of this information in the chat so you can access um, the links and the slides are available on our website. So you'll be able to um, uh, access those slides right on our website. Um, let me share my screen. Hopefully this works. Does everyone see my screen? Some nods? Okay, great. Um, so uh, let me see how I, here we go. Just a quick introduction. Um, we are the Department of Small Business Services. Um, we help unlock economic potential by creating uh, good jobs, stronger businesses, and thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. Um, important to distinguish us from the SBA, which is a federal agency. Um, SBS is the city agency uh, for our small businesses. All year round, you can access uh, a tremendous amount of services through our NYC Business Solutions Centers. There's business courses, training, legal assistance, help navigating government. Um, if you certify as a minority or woman-owned business, you can sell to government, uh, training, financing assistance, um, and much, much more. Um, so all year round, you can access um, a tremendous amount of free services. Uh, today, we'll focus uh, primarily on some of the COVID resources that are available for businesses that have been impacted um, through this pandemic. The most important piece of information to walk away from uh, this presentation is how to stay up to date. Um, this is important for you and your business and your employees. Um, as I'm sure you know at this point, information is just constantly changing. Um, and so these are the best resources to make sure you stay on top of in order to stay informed. Um, our website, nyc.gov business is where you can find um, rules, regulations, as well as free services that are available to help. Um, the state website, so the state is really putting out a lot of the um, guidelines and re regulations, um, and they differ by industry. So it's extremely important to stay um, on top of the state website, which is forward.ny.gov, um, to keep track of uh, what your industry needs to know. Um, and lastly, for um, health updates, um, nyc.gov slash coronavirus um, to stay on top of uh, important uh, health information related to the pandemic. We will go through all of these. Again, um, it's important to go to the state website to see uh, what falls under all of these categories. But in general, um, there's regulations that you have to be um, uh, aware of uh, surrounding physical distancing, everyone in your business, employees and customers must maintain six feet distance. Um, everyone must have the correct personal protective equipment. So employers are responsible for providing face coverings to employees, um, as well as having sanitizer um, and uh, 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 other um, uh, protective equipment um, on the premises. Um, having strict cleaning and hygiene protocols and posting those protocols. 
um, uh, somewhere uh, prominently in the uh, in your in your business. Uh, conducting health screenings. Um, there should be someone on site whose job it is to conduct these health screenings. Um, if you need a template to help um, guide through these health screenings, uh, there's a link at the bottom of this slide where you can find that. And then lastly, communications, how you're keeping your employees and customers safe and sharing information with them um, in terms of uh, following the correct protocols. Um, and Berth will probably talk a little bit more about these and how to um, make sure that you're in compliance. Uh, there's also an additional set of requirements uh, depending on uh, cluster action zones. Um, so if there has been a spike in cases, um, there are certain areas um, that may have additional restrictions. Um, right now, uh, I believe there are parts of Queens that are included in a yellow zone. Um, this means that uh, there's a four person maximum for indoor and outdoor dining at food establishments. Um, and there's some restrictions on large gatherings, um, but businesses may remain open, um, just making sure that they're uh, closely following the correct protocols. Um, and so there are a number of resources that I will quickly cover today. I believe the commissioner mentioned um, a lot of them. Um, uh, so we will go through um, each one of these um, and I hope you will take advantage, but uh, I will first turn it over to Berth, who will get us started um, to talk about our compliance advisors. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Berth Ambrose. I'm a compliance advisor with the Department of Small Business Services. I'm here today to just tell you a little bit about the program. The city offers free compliance advisor consultations for all small businesses in the five boroughs. They are one-on-one -on -one consultations. Right now during COVID, it is virtual. Usually when it, the program was initiated in 2016, we would go in person. As long as you are a small business with a brick and mortar, we are allowed to come to your business. It is free of charge. No violations are ever given. It's a program that was created because a lot of small businesses, their biggest fear was that they were fine with the regulatory agencies coming, but can someone come and just help me out before inspectors comes or before you would open? Um, we do these consultations in all the major languages, Spanish, English, Russian, and all the dialects of Chinese and Haitian Creole. Most of our eligible businesses are food service establishments, retail and personal care. But like I said, if you guys have a brick and mortar, we would be glad to come to your business. You're able to sign up on our website, nyc.gov slash bizconsult, or just call the business hotline 888-SBS-4NYC. That is 888-727-4692. We'd be glad to come to your business. It's always free and there's never a limit. So just like Mary said before, we're just gonna talk about a couple of COVID regulations that you guys should be informed of either before you restart your business during this time or if you are starting a new business during COVID. Uh, most of this, all of these can be found on the governor's website, reopening website, forward.ny.gov. Uh, I always say the first thing you start with is just you find your industry and you just read the guidelines. You read the guidelines just to make sure you know what you need to do in regards to social distancing, communication, just always to keep you, your employees, and your customers safe. Next, you affirm and you read the interim guidelines just to state to the state that you have read these guidelines and that you, you are going to follow them. Then you lay out these guidelines in a safety plan. The safety plan is pretty clean cut. You just write all the rules and regulations that you are gonna follow in regards to your business. I always say the safety plan should be a living, breathing document where you're always adapting to the new, new rules and changing them as long as it follows the guidelines and is best for your business. This helps you be prepared, your customers feel safe and your employees feel even safer. And every time you have an inspection, at least now during COVID, inspectors will ask you for it. And it's a good way for you to prepare in case anything happens during this time. And then we're going to move on to some specific regulations, mostly in regards to food and beverage, the state liquor authority, and restaurants during this time. 
So especially during this time, we want everyone to feel safe, but actually have the freedom to live a little more normal lives. So these are the key regulations to follow from the State Liquor Authority. Um, no consumption of beverages within 100 feet of your business. Um, while you are selling alcohol at your business, you have to provide food. Um, restaurants, bars, gyms are not allowed to open for now between the hours of 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. And after 11 a.m., no deliveries can be sold with alcohol. And then three strikes and you're out rule. You know, you try your best to follow the rules. We know that everyone slips every once in a while, but try to do your best to always follow the rules so that you don't gain the consequence of losing your liquor license. Mm. One of the biggest innovations that was starting during COVID was the, is the NYC Open Restaurants Program where it allows food service establishments that are permitted by DOH Department of Health to have outdoor seating during this time, roadside, and sidewalk, you know, as citizens of New York City, we've probably seen them around our neighborhoods or around the city altogether. They have been a major innovation from DOT. Um, while DOT has great guidelines and pictures on their website, our team will do step-by-step -step, uh, consultations with you because we do understand that sometimes, you know, you just want either maybe you don't understand the rules or you just want someone to guide you. Someone that would just look at your property with you, we do it virtually, we do it over the phone. We try our best to navigate you through these rules during this time, because at the end of the day, we want everyone to follow rules and we don't, you know, violations aren't really key. We just want safety and able for the businesses to have the possibility to grow. The rules and regulations to sign up for the consultations and also to just to make sure, and also to apply is on the DOT website, nyc.gov slash open restaurants. We hope all restaurants take the, this opportunity to sell outside and do it safely. And then in the other side of it on nyc.gov slash open storefronts, there is an outdoor program for storefronts for retail retail, personal care, and even restaurants if they rather this setup than the open restaurant setup. It was started in October 30th, 2020, and will has been extended for now till September 30th, 2021. It is a way for you to utilize the sidewalk, do it safely. One of the key regulations for both the programs is just to make sure you follow the rules of the sidewalk and then always keep an eight foot clear path for pedestrians to walk. If you guys ever have any questions, ever want to go above and beyond, please feel free to sign up for our consultations. You could always call our hotline 888-SBS-4NYC. That is 888-727-4692. Our team will gladly have, have you and gladly be able to host these consultations with you. Thank you so much, Berth. Um, I will say um, Berth and um, her team of compliance advisors are a real wealth of information. Um, and uh, you know, as Berth said, um, there's no violations that come out of uh, working with this group. Um, they're really just here to help you navigate all of the rules and requirements and um, help you stay in compliance so you avoid those fines and violations later. So um, definitely uh, we encourage you to take advantage and Berth will be um, on the line um, for any questions that you might have. Um, just to quickly go through some of the other free services that um, we hope you will take advantage of if you need. Um, we, uh, the city is providing up to free, up to five free face coverings um, for your employees. You can access those if you go to the website. Um, you can find locations where our partners are distributing um, these face coverings. Uh, and if you need other uh, PPE equipment, office furniture, um, uh, sanitizer, gloves, um, plastic barriers, um, there's a marketplace online um, and you can find um, businesses that are selling um, that equipment um, very easily uh, through our online marketplace. Uh, we know um, top of mind for a lot of business right, right now is financial assistance. Um, and so there are several loan and grant programs that are available 
um, both through the government and also philanthropic, private, and non-government um, organizations. Um, the Paycheck Protection Program, the Idle Advance, the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, um, the New York Forward Loan Fund, which is a, a low interest loan up to $100,000 to help with reopening costs through the state. Um, uh, a tremendous amount of programs. We'll actually go through a few others in just a minute, um, but you can access um, uh, more information at nyc.gov slash financing assistance. Um, and a representative will um, help walk you through um, any of the options that might be best for your business. Um, we are especially focusing on helping federal dollars get to our New York City small businesses. Uh, so through the Fair Share NYC program, uh, there are webinars and one-on-one -on -one assistance um, and connections to lenders if you don't already have a lender um, to help you access the Paycheck Protection Program funds, um, as well as uh, the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant. Um, uh, so if you are interested, uh, the deadline for the Paycheck Protection Program as of now is March 31st. So, um, you know, definitely um, think about that um, if you're interested, you can find more information at nyc.gov slash PPP. Um, and if you are um, an arts or entertainment venue, um, you should look into the um, Shuttered Venue Operators Grant, which is nyc.gov slash curtains up NYC to access um, help applying uh, to that program. Um, you can navigate this a little bit um, on our website um, following the presentation, um, but in case uh, you've been declined or you're not eligible for um, the federal uh, loan programs or some of the other ones that we mentioned, um, there are other opportunities for you. So we encourage you to reach out to um, our small business um, solution centers um, to find out more. A lot of small business owners, especially storefronts, are um, having trouble making rent. Um, and so we do have a commercial lease assistance program, which are free legal consultations um, that can help you with signing a new lease or amending or renewing um, or terminating an existing commercial lease um, or addressing any other commercial lease related issue that you might be having. Um, and you can access that at nyc.gov slash lease. We have several online business education courses um, to help you uh, pivot your uh, business online since um, uh, a lot of the in-person um, business may um, you know, be, be decreased right now. Um, and so if you need help on uh, search engine optimization or building a website, um, definitely check out. We have so many um, really incredible online programs that are available to help. And um, you can find that on our Eventbrite page. Um, nycsmallbizcourses.eventbrite.com. Uh, we just launched a uh, playbook um, with Deloitte, um, which is um, uh, a guide uh, to help businesses adapt during this new normal. Um, it includes a playbook that you could just access and read through on your own online, um, and then also a workshop series that you could sign up for um, and it helps you um, both in the short term and the long term planning of your business um, during and hopefully after the pandemic. Uh, we have a few different business mentorship programs. So if you're looking for a mentor to help you um, uh, grow your business or adapt or even start your business, um, you can access experts who will um, work one on one with you. Um, to answer all your questions um, and just be a support. Um, and so definitely um, check out uh, a few of the programs that we have for Black entrepreneurs, for storefront owners, and for minority and women-owned businesses. And you can find out more at nyc.gov slash business mentors. Lastly, uh, employee support. And there's several resources that are available to help your employees um, through difficult times. Um, both uh, information on safe and sick leave, um, making sure that they're taking care of their mental health, um, the shared work program, um, which is partial unemployment through the Department of Labor, um, if you need to reduce hours, um, how to manage discrimination and harassment in the workplace that might be a result of COVID, 
um, and then also um, workforce training and job placement um, uh, services uh, through our Workforce One Career Centers. So I'll stop there. It's a ton of information. Again, we uh, encourage you to look through these slides following the presentation. I'll drop um, the links uh, in the chat so you can access uh, several of these programs. Um, if you have any questions at all, please call us on our hotline 888-SBS-4NYC, and um, we are happy to help in a variety of languages. Um, so please feel free to call that. If you don't like the phone, you can also reach us through email at covid19biz at sbs.nyc.gov. Um, and we will be on the line for uh, any additional questions. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Meredith, Bertha, and Commissioner. I have to say that this team is 24-7. And I have to shout out a Meredith uh, Bernadette Nation from your team who arrived with uh, Sharon Anderson and the borough president this weekend to speak with the businesses that were impacted by the fire in Jackson Heights. And so thank you for everything you do. I see we have a lot of um, the uh, merchants associations and bid directors on this call. And we very much appreciate everything you've done throughout this time. So thanks for staying on for the, the q and A. I I know we have a number of questions for you to follow up. And next, I'd like to um, introduce the sheriff, the New York City Office of the Sheriff. We have Joseph Facito here. If you can please unmute, thank you. All right, in the event that he may have been called away, um, we can come back to him. And I'd like to have our partners, the borough planners at the NYC Department of Transportation. We have Andrew or John on the line. Thank you, Andrew. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Andrew Arcees from New York City DOT, borough planner in the Queens Borough Commissioner's Office. Um, so I, we touched a little bit on open restaurants and open storefronts. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about the program. I know a lot has changed since the inception specific of the program, specifically open restaurants. Um, just, just a reminder that this is, uh, was an unveiled as a temporary slash emergency uh, program, you know, as a result of COVID, but it is being planned uh, to be permanent um, and long-term. That is still in the works and there, there's a lot that, that will be coming out um, about that later this year. I'm not too sure exactly when, but as of now, um, roadway setups um, are, and are expected to continue to follow winterized guidelines. Um, so the most recent guidance that we had issued, and that's currently on our website at DOT, uh, that's nyc.gov slash open restaurants. Um, and just a quick, I'll, I'll go through it real fast, but you know, main takeaways are 18 inch barriers, um, completely filled with sand or soil, uh, high visibility reflective tape around these barriers, uh, as well as snow sticks on the corners of the wall that faces traffic. I know we're, we're only 10 days away from spring, but as, as a lifelong New Yorker, you and I all know that, that snow is possible still uh, as we enter you know, into the early, early spring months. So um, just keep that in mind. And then I know some restaurants have been uh, told that you need a, a Yodok barrier or an additional barrier filled with water. Um, you, you should know who you are. You, you, you were most likely contacted by us uh, at least a couple months back. Um, uh, just a couple other notes, you know, heating elements, you know, keep following DOB, Department of Buildings, that is, and FDNY guidance. Um, in, my, in my experience, electric heaters seem to be um, a little easier to, to work with compared to uh, gas uh, powered heaters. So, um, that, but it just a lot less happening there. So, um, and uh, uh, we are doing inspections, and that's that, that is DOT that that's doing inspections. And when we uh, come across a setup, particularly a roadway setup, but it could be sidewalk as well. Uh, but if we come across a setup that's not meeting our criteria uh, or is deemed not safe, you will receive a a notice um, asking you to make corrections. Uh, and and it's okay; it's not punitive. It's not meant to be punitive. It's it's really what we're trying to do is to. Um, just make it work for everybody and keep everything safe uh, for, for the diners as well as uh, all roadway users. So if, if you receive a notice like that, 
um, and you're unsure as to what it is maybe that, that you're being asked to correct, you are more than welcome to reach out to us. Uh, I know it was mentioned before the SPS hotline, um, but you can also reach out to DOT um, by calling our Queen's office, uh, 212-839-2510. Um, and you know, you make those corrections. We're happy to walk you through it, but you can, but in order to clear yourself, so to say, uh, just take some photos of the new setup and uh, you can submit online through our web form and it'll, it should be um, either get a reinspection in person or even approved online. Um, and uh, yes, and just one other thing, please be sure to keep checking your email that you registered with. There are updates to the program all the time and we want you to be up to date and also be able to receive things like snow alerts um, and notifications about potential uh, giveaways or, or things like that, um, where we have been able to offer some material. So um, stay in touch. We like to stay in touch. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm here, here to help. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. We really appreciate all of the um, agility you've had over these, this past year and look forward to continued partnership. Um, we're going to try one more time for Sheriff Fasudo. I think if you press star six, you may be able to unmute. I know he's on the phone, so it's a little bit of a different. Perfect. Okay. I think you can hear me. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. We've had a lot of audio problems this morning. Thank you for your patience. So uh, I, I wanted to come on the phone today to talk to everyone. A lot of people panic when they hear the word sheriff. They think that somehow they're going to get in trouble and that the sheriff is going to put them out of business. That is the farthest thing from the truth. In order for the sheriff to be involved in enforcement against your business, you really have to be doing not one thing wrong. You have to be doing multiple things wrong, and they have to be very, very serious. So if you're a, a new business and you're opening up and you make small mistakes, you're not going to have the sheriff there looking to close you down. I think that's very important. So I want to give you a little background. So as you know, we've been doing a lot of enforcement <clears throat> at different locations, and people hear it as, well, the sheriff is shutting down bars and nightclubs. These locations were illegal before COVID-19. So when we take COVID-19 out of the picture, the locations we've been at have, were never legal. They don't meet the standards of selling alcohol, meeting building and fire code uh, standards. They were completely illegal before COVID-19. COVID-19 just made them worse. So I just I have a little analysis here so you can understand you don't have to worry about the sheriff shutting you down if you make a small mistake. Since August, we have taken enforcement action at 45 locations throughout the city, these large scale type of events that you may have read about. Of the 45 locations, all 45 had health offenses. There's no, no surprise there. They, they were not social distancing. Uh, 44 of them had alcohol beverage control law offenses. That means that they were selling alcohol without a license, right? That was illegal before COVID-19. That's illegal now. You can't sell alcohol without obtaining a permit from the state liquor authority. So that's a very important thing to note. Of the 45 locations, 37 of them had fire and building code offenses, meaning that they had blocked egresses. They had no certificate of occupancy. <clears throat> they structured the locations in a way that actually acted as a public health hazard in itself, separate and apart from COVID-19. And then 25 of those 45 locations had other types of criminal offenses going on, illegal fight club, illegal weapons, illegal gambling. So in order for the sheriff to be focusing on your organization, you have to be doing multiple offenses. And I don't think anybody on this call is involved in this type of activity. So I, I really wanted to tell the residents of Queens, they could take a breather, you can relax. The sheriff is not gonna be there to shut you down right away because you made a mistake. And as small business services indicated, they're looking to help you. We want you to succeed. This is so important. We want businesses to succeed. And as businesses come back online, there will be mistakes. But as long as you're looking to try to fix any problems you have, no one is looking to put you out of business. And I thought that was a very important thing for me to come on today to tell you about. I don't want you panicked that somehow you make a mistake and the sheriff is gonna shut you down. Thank you, Sheriff. We appreciate the clarity you've brought today and um, everything you're doing to keep us um, safe and to keep our businesses up and running. We very much appreciate your um, the work you're doing and, and, and making the time today to be on the call. 
We um, would love to next introduce our partners at uh, the New York City Consumer and Worker Protection Agency, our Community Affairs Associate, Ms. Maria Maldano Galdemez. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, yes, my name is Miriam Aldana Galdamez, and I work for the Department, New York City Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. And at DCWP, our mission is to protect and enhance the daily economic lives of uh, New Yorkers to create thriving communities. And I would like to thank uh, the Office of the Queens Board of Presidents for having me provide uh, agency uh, updates related to COVID-19. And um, I want to start uh, with some updates regarding the New York City-based safe and sick leave law. And uh, effective uh, September 30th, 2020, domestic workers can now accrue New York City-based safe and sick leave up to 40 hours or five days at the same rate uh, as other workers covered under the law. Employees may use uh, leave as they accrue it there is no longer a 120 day waiting period to use New York City based safe and sick leave. Employees based off or any other document issued each pay period must list the amount of accrued and used leave and the total balance of uh, accrued leave. And effective January 1st, 2021, employers with 100 or more employees must provide up to 56 hours or seven days of paid leave. And employers with four or fewer employees and a net income of a million or more dollars must provide paid leave. Um, that's regarding the pay safe and sick leave, but I also wanted to um, uh, give you an update on uh, the restaurant COVID-19 recovery surcharge bill. And um, this bill became law uh, on October, 2020. And this is, it's optional for restaurants, not customers. Um, uh, restaurants must call it uh, a COVID-19 recovery charge and cannot call it anything else. Um, the surcharge cannot exceed 10% uh, of a consumer's total bill uh, before taxes and tip, and the restaurant must disclose the amount of, uh, of surcharge to the, co to the consumer um, before food beverage are uh, ordered. And um, the restaurant may require the COVID-19 recovery charge only for indoor dining or for properly permitted outdoor dining. And this surcharge will be permitted until 90 days after the state of emergency is lifted and full indoor dining is once again permitted. Um, other uh, updates I have today is online and in-person services. Um, due to the current COVID-19 state of emergency, DCWP will be accepting applications and requirements via um, our online system. If your application requires documentation that cannot be uploaded online, please mail it uh, via USPS and email it to onlineapps.docs at DCA that nyc.gov and I'm going to share all this information in the chat um, and if you need to take an exam or get uh, fingerprinted for your license all exams and uh, fingerprints will be uh, um, administered at the DCA licensing center at 42 Broadway by appointment only at this time and uh, appointments can be made by emailing licensing appointments at dca.nyc.gov or by calling 212-436-0441. Uh, if a new license or renewal requires an exam or fingerprint, uh, you cannot operate, that's important. So um, license extensions and renewals, um, so DCWP is extending certain license expiration dates and renewal application deadlines. You can visit nyc.gov slash business toolbox for more information. Um, I'm, I'm also gonna uh, leave my contact information in case you uh, anyone has a 
question, you can always contact me as well. And DCWP is still mailing out renewal packages for certain license categories. Um, you must follow the instructions on your renewal notice regarding current submission processes. And um, lastly, um, we have um, our Office of uh, Financial Empowerment. And um, so um, New York City Financial Empowerment Centers provide free one-on-one -on -one professional financial counseling and coaching to support you in reaching your goals. Um, so they can help you manage your money and set up a spending plan. Um, they can um, develop a strategy to minimize debt. They can also um, uh, access local, state, and federal emergency resources. And uh, they can also uh, help you separate personal and business finances and uh, much more. Those are some uh, examples, but you can um, visit nyc.gov slash talk money to book an appointment, or you can also call 311, which is the easiest way to, to do it. Uh, but I'm gonna leave all this information in the chat um, and including my email address. So if you have any question, you, you can always contact me. And those are my updates for today. And I'm gonna uh, be here just to, if anyone has questions. Thank you so much for all that information and the updates on the latest regulations. We appreciate you, Miriam, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, next, we're grateful to have two representatives from our New York City uh, Fire Department. I'd like to introduce Deputy Chief Mike Brown. Please unmute. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking me. And uh, uh, I'd like to just share with you some of the things that the New York City Fire Department has been doing uh, to try to to uh, help get us through some of these uh, more difficult uh, uh, times that, that we're going through. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, permitting, uh, the fire department all, uh, uh, issues permits for, for various things uh, throughout the city regarding uh, fire code. Uh, and the, we've uh, instituted an application process online for various certificates of fitness so that you don't have to come to uh, headquarters in order to uh, apply for some of these uh, 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 permits and for uh, certificates of fitness. Uh, also, there's an electronic uh, queuing system when you do need to come down to for, uh, headquarters for some of those things. Uh, there's an, uh, an online, um, uh, it's a, a, a uh, electronic queuing process where you uh, scan a QR code when you get to the door and uh, you get a text alert when, uh, when they're ready to receive you so that you don't have to wait inside. You can wait in, uh, in a car or outside uh, to try to maintain uh, more social distancing. Uh, also online application processes for uh, things such as fire alarm applications. If you're installing or uh, renovating a fire alarm system, or range hood system or uh, EPPG, which is emergency planning and preparedness guys. That's more for larger buildings, but uh, those are all available online. Uh, we've also instituted a uh, remote video inspection uh, for, uh, at this point it's for fire alarm inspections where uh, uh, a new business has installed a fire alarm system uh, or an existing business has renovated a fire alarm system, uh, we can do a, uh, a partial remote inspection instead of having to have our inspectors come into uh, to, uh, the building or the business. Uh, we are instituting uh, right now a, a pilot program with the range hood inspection that per you know, pertains to restaurants where for their annual inspections, they've got to have a, a range hood inspection where an inspector comes in and we're we're undergoing a pilot uh, test to see how we can work that as a remote uh, process where uh, an owner or a manager or another responsible person 
uses a, a, uh, a either a, a phone or an iPad or some other device to uh, to video what needs to be uh, looked at by the inspectors. Uh, uh, we've also provided uh, early in the pandemic, uh, the mayor's, mayor's office uh, inspections, we provided inspectors, fire prevention inspectors to uh, help uh, educate and uh, uh, hand out masks uh, during the early process before uh, masks were really widely available uh, and to educate uh, uh, business owners uh, opening up and restaurant owners uh, that were at the time were closed, but uh, were doing uh, curbside and takeout. So uh, our inspectors went into those businesses to try to uh, just maintain uh, safety uh, uh, issues such as uh, egre egresses, blocked egresses, um, and also uh, lots of places put up um, plexiglass barriers. Uh, things got changed around from typical business, and, and we just wanted to maintain uh, uh, safety for employees and owners. And uh, so our inspectors were involved in that. Um, uh, we also were, uh, uh, uh worked, uh, to, uh, um, educate people on hand alcohol based hand sanitizers, which are, uh, really alcohol is flammable. So we just wanted to make sure that people understood, uh, the, the dangers of it and, uh, to help with storing particularly large quantities of it. Uh, it, it is a fire hazard. Uh, and uh, through education, we can uh, try to avoid any uh, any safety issues with it. Um, we also worked closely with small business services uh, to uh, streamline the, the certificate of fitness uh, application process for uh, propane when it came to uh, um, outdoor dining and trying to... Uh, have heating, safe heating for outdoor dining. Uh, so we, we streamlined this, the certificate of fitness process by uh, having the test online. That was a first for FDNY. And uh, uh, we also had uh, uh, on-site testing for people to get the C of F. Uh, uh, we also issued uh, guidelines on uh, on safe use of propane, safe use and handling of propane. Uh, I know that was a, a bit of a, uh, a, an issue. Uh, there was propane typically is a very uh, highly uh, uh, restricted use in New York City. And uh, we, we did work with the mayor's office and uh, 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 restaurants to try to have safe uh, use of propane. Uh, and uh, also educating the owners and uh, trying not to have it be a punitive when we found things that were not being used correctly uh, or legally. We tried to uh, institute a non-punitive, uh, uh, more of an educational approach to that. Um, uh, lastly, we've instituted uh, um, professional certification for uh, corrected fire alarm defects instead of having to have our inspectors come back out to uh, uh, when, when we did find a, a defect in a fire alarm installation uh, where um, you owners could have uh, uh, professionals sign off on uh, uh, corrected defects so that uh, it, it, it reduces uh, interaction, personal interaction uh, during the COVID uh, epidemic so that uh, people can uh, more maintain uh, social distancing. Um, uh, if, if we have any questions, uh, I'd be glad to take them uh, later or uh, online uh, very, with the chat. And also, uh, if there's if there are any questions, uh, that you can uh, refer to three one one and ask them for the uh, Bureau of Fire Prevention uh, Call Service Center. They, they, our, our Call Service Center has a, a lot of. Uh, uh, information and they're very good at getting back either via email or by phone. 
So that, uh, but just be sure to specify when you call 311 that you're looking for the Bureau of Fire Prevention uh, uh, Call Service Center. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Chief. And um, thanks again, the bar president has been uh, co-hosting a series of town halls for the communities around Queens. And we re very much appreciate your partnership with that. And we'll keep everybody posted on when the next town hall that we co-host um, is. Um, I also like to thank uh, Kelly Carr for being here. I'm not sure if you have any additional comments. No, but I'll make myself available for the Q and A later. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And I would love to um, also give um, Anna Schatz from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, who's a Deputy Co-Development Council, an opportunity if you'd like to unmute, and then we will go to Q&A after that. Thank you, Anna. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for having me here. Uh, thank you, uh, our President um, and all the staff. I'm going to share my screen um, real quick to give some updates. Um, I think that should have done it. So um, just to start off, I um, wanna talk about some of the data um, regarding current cases and percent positivity of COVID-19 in New York City. Uh, this is data that is pulled from our website. So you can go on, on nyc.gov uh, forward slash um, health and click on COVID. And this is all information that is there. Um, everything that's in the slides can be found on our website. But uh, the redder the areas are in the map that you see on the slide, uh, the um, higher percent positivity and the seven day percent uh, positivity that you see um, in New York City. And um, as you can tell, it is uh, still very much red and some areas are redder than others. Um, and on the right here is a um, graph of um, the, the second wave that we're experiencing. So. Um, although it is, uh, you know, looking to be declining a little bit, we don't have the uh, most recent data as um, that is still being reported. Um, but there's this, uh, you know, jaggedy line, which is different from what we were seeing in the first wave that was very smooth uh, shooting up. Um, so this is indicating that we know what works, we know what uh, we need to do to prevent the spread, um, and all the things that are true that held a year ago still hold true now. Um, what we need to do is to get tested. Um, you can find a test by going to mic.gov slash COVID test or calling 212 COVID-19 and then following the core for uh, prevention strategies of staying home if you're sick, wearing a face covering, keeping our physical distance and washing our hands using hand sanitizer uh, when soap and water are not available and avoiding travel and gatherings um, still uh, as much as we can. Um, and the commissioner um, put out an advisory for older New Yorkers and people with underlying health conditions, um, but also their uh, caretakers and their household members, um, not only those that are at a higher risk of uh, COVID-19 and severe COVID-19 need to be uh, taking these precautions, but also those that uh, reside with them and are interacting with them as caregivers. Um, and uh, we have updated face covering guidelines that are available on our website um, as uh, per the recommendations from the CDC. Um, so to give that extra layer of protection, um, especially as uh, there is a transmission that's happening within New York City still. Um, it's creating that extra layer by using a disposable mask, which is that surgical mask, that like the blue one that is um, currently easier uh, to obtain, um, and then using a face, a face uh, cloth face covering over it and making sure that both cover the nose and the mouth um, to create that extra barrier. And this is our campaign, NYC Vaccine for All, with our Lady Liberty that got her vaccine over here and is wearing her face covering, um, just letting everyone know that uh, the vaccine is safe, and that it's free, and it is easy uh, to obtain. 
2018, and uh, we're encouraging everyone that is eligible to uh, make an appointment and uh, for those that are not eligible yet to uh, take the steps to make the decision um, if you want to get vaccinated or not. Um, this is what the vaccination uh, numbers are looking like right now. Um, <clears throat> This is the amount of the vaccines delivered to New York City, those that received the first and the second dose, and um, our data is uh, changing a little bit to include the, the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine, which is only one dose, so um, it doesn't need the, the two-dose uh, breakdown. Um, and this is also updated every a day in um, our uh, data page on the vaccine uh, site of uh, the COVID uh, website. And other data that we're um, showing in an effort to be as transparent as possible as um, the, uh, the race, ethnicity, and um, by age group uh, broken down as to those who got vaccinated. This is inconclusive data because we haven't received information from all the vaccination sites. Not every provider has been um, letting us know the race and ethnicity of those that have received the vaccine. Um, but even with this inconclusive data, we see that throughout um, all the age groups, uh, white New Yorkers are getting vaccinated at a higher rate. So um, we wanna make sure that uh, we're addressing this and um, creating um, access uh, as much as possible in areas that are lacking them. Um, and another way to uh, show our data is by uh, zip code breakdown. And this is also just a scre uh, screenshot straight from our website uh, showing those that have gotten the partial vac vaccine. So like the first dose only, and then uh, those that are fully vaccinated um, have received both doses. Um, so we're hoping to get this map as blue as possible uh, within the next couple of months. Um, the New York City Vaccine for All campaign um, uh, does focus on equitable distribution, and we do want to acknowledge the history and the current experiences of racism and bias in healthcare um, that uh, communities are experiencing and um, those that have significantly been impacted by COVID-19 uh, throughout this pandemic. And so we work to ensure uh, that there's both access and confidence. Um, and the Vaccine Command Center is an interagency effort um, that is uh, led by some of our partners um, here. Um, and we are uh, driving uh, the, the force by um, partnerships with federal state governments, um, our community, community-based organizations, um, our community leaders, um, elected uh, city um, agencies and sector partners. Um, and uh, here's some basics about what the vaccines are. They are safe, they are recommended. Um, no shortcuts were taken in uh, the uh, development of the vaccine. And um, even if you already have had COVID-19 or have antibodies, um, it is still recommended that you get the vaccine. It does not contain uh, the actual COVID-19 virus and uh, it does not alter your DNA. Um, there are three vaccines that have currently received the uh, FDA emergency use authorization. They are the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the Johnson & Johnson Janssen. Um, the Pfizer and the Moderna are both mRNA vaccines and they require two doses, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the second dose um, should be given uh, for the Pfizer vaccine 21 to 42 days um, after the first dose, and then for the Moderna um, 28 to 42 days after the first dose. It is not recommended that you get it earlier than the uh, 21 or 28 days um, after the first one, but if you can't get the vaccine within that time frame, just get it as soon as possible after that, it is still going to be effective. This is just a recommendation um, of how much time that needs pass. Um, and also a reminder that if you receive the Pfizer for the first dose, you need to get the Pfizer for the second and the same thing for Moderna. If you got the Moderna for the first dose, you should get the Moderna for the second. Um, and the appointment for your second dose should be made at the same location where you received your first dose. Um, and then for the Johnson & Johnson is an adenovirus vector vaccine and it requires only one dose so you don't have to worry about the second um, appointment. 
Um, and even after you get your vaccine, uh, people still must continue um, doing the core four, wearing a face covering, uh, keeping physical distance and limiting gatherings um, as we're waiting for more New Yorkers to get vaccinated. Um, to get the vaccine, um, so the federal government manages distribution um, from uh, manufacturers to states and localities. Um, the uh, city, us in New York City, we receive an allocation proportionate to our population. And um, again, this is something that you can um, look further into on our data page. Um, and the supply is still uh, extremely limited. And as we get more supply, we'll be able to um, have additional sites, um, have more appointments available, and uh, vaccinate more New Yorkers. Um, so the distribution right now due to supply is still based on eligibility, a uh, phased uh, distribution, um, and it is based on CDC guidance, and the state is the one that determines the priorities, um, and then we just um, adapt it at the city level. Um, and the priority groups are determined by um, putting those that are at a higher risk of uh, both exposure and getting severe COVID-19 are uh, put first. Um, and this includes uh, healthcare workers, uh, recently added those that are 60 uh, and over, as it was 65 and older, um, just recently uh, residents and staff in nursing homes, homeless shelters, um, other uh, residential facilities, group, group residential facilities, um, essential workers, and those with underlying uh, health conditions, and a complete robust list can be found on um, nyc.gov COVID vaccine distribution and also on the state website. Um, so if you feel like you might be eligible, go ahead and check it out. Um, and then you have to fill out an attestation form on the state website. Um, and we're expecting that uh, mid this year, anyone will be able to get the vaccine um, at the same kind of places where you would get your like flu shot type of thing. So um, just hold tight for everyone that is still not eligible um, until it is our turn to get it. Um, and um, we want to enhance access and build confidence. Um, so the city's response, again, it is grounded in equity um, and um, the whole COVID-19 response. And uh, this rings through also for the vaccine campaign, um, you know, and uh, a successful and equitable distribution would mean enhancing access and building confidence. Um, so in terms of enhancing access, um, we use data um, to find out um, where the uptake um, so far is showing disparities. Um, and want to also point out that the disparities uh, so far do reflect national trends. It's not just a New York City uh, situation. Um, and we want to prioritize um, you know, the, uh, areas. Um, and we're working with the Racial Inclusion and Equity Task Force um, and increased the number of equity neighborhoods from 27 that we had earlier in the year to 33 different neighborhoods. And then access, and for access, again, um, we are expanding sites and ensuring distribution to pharmacies and local providers as supply increases. This is all very much based on the supply uh, that is available. But uh, for everyone that um, is eligible, appointments can be made either online at the vaccinefinder.nyc.gov site or by calling 877-VAX for NYC. The number is 877-829-4692. Um, if you need assistance over the phone, um, if you're having trouble navigating the website, um, trying to improve the experience, the user experience um, as much as possible, always as we're hearing the concerns uh, from community uh, members and partners and leaders um, and partnered with DIFTA, uh, NYCHA development and community-based organizations uh, to help community members get appointments in the 33 uh, priority neighborhoods. Um, if anyone needs transportation, you can call that same number 877-VAX4NYC and they'll help you get transportation not only to the city run sites, but to any of the locations. Um, and there's language access available at all the sites as well. Um, by calling an interpreter. If anyone needs it, just ask for it or tell a folk to ask for it. Um, and then through building confidence is, um, you know, 
through our town halls, community conversations, and events. Uh, we've partnered with uh, Brooklyn, um, Queensborough presidents um, to have uh, several town halls already. Um, so, you know, through these kinds of conversations and um, presentations, we hope to um, educate and ask, uh, answer questions that anyone might have. And uh, looking forward to anyone that has heard the information is able to then pass it along to someone that has the same questions. Um, we have several videos available on our website. We have Dr. Easterling doing a vaccine introduction uh, PowerPoint that can be shared uh, with anyone and flyers, uh, palm cards um, in different languages that can be either downloaded or calling 311 order it, we'll print it out and mail it to you so you can share it with your new community. And just to close it out, um, again, um, it's an appointment if you are already eligible, um, practice the core four, um, access our website, go to um, trusted sources of information uh, to get your most up-to-date information. And then if you already have received your vaccine, do share your story. Uh, we're using uh, the below hashtags um, to um, amplify the message that the vaccines are uh, safe and uh, free and easy to get. Uh, thank you so much. You're on mute, sorry. You're still on mute, sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Anna. Appreciate it. We're going to probably stay on the health theme for a little bit while, um, while we go into Q&A. Um, so appreciate you uh, standing by. Uh, the Burr Hall has also been hosting a series of vaccine town halls in addition to the fire safety. So we will make sure that we put that information in the chat as well. And um, now we'd like to open it up um, for questions. And so there are a number of questions that are in already posted in the chat. I'll start with those. And feel free, please feel free to put your, your questions there or raise your hand. And I'd like to uh, continue on this theme if, if, uh, if that's OK with um, asking a few questions about vaccination and about the clusters. And so there have been a number of questions um, about whether uh, these uh, zones will be updated um, and where is Queens regarding any sort of update regarding to these uh, the, the zones and I think the last update it says was uh, January 27th so the questions are regarding how often is this map updated and I'm wondering if any of our health representatives might be able to answer that. All right, I could just take a stab at this. Is this regarding the data, uh, the page with the, the maps that I was showing? Um, those will be updated every day um, with both the cases as we get the information uh, from the testing sites and then with also the uh, vaccines as we're getting the information. So the, the last few days, there's going to be a little bit of a lag as we get the information in, but every day we do update it with the most um, recent uh, data that we have. Um, I think that they're um, they're asking whether you are aligned with the state updates. So, are, are these the same data that you're using, or are these? Yeah, so it'll be okay. uh, it'll be uh, as much safe as possible um, as we get the uh, information from the state that we um, uh, downloaded into our city databases. Okay. Um, and then I, there's another question asking about when is the next eligible group of workers um, and, and as, as staff are vaccinated, are they still required to socially distance and specifically we're asking about restaurant workers and grocery store workers. Okay. So um, as I said earlier, the eligibility groups are determined by the state. So our governor is the one that's going to uh, let us know. So we just wait on um, that from him. Um, but in terms of um, the, the fully vaccinated people, on March 8th, uh, the CDC released its interim public health recommendations uh, for fully vaccinated people. Um, this is a newly released guidance um, and uh, that the health department uh, will be uh, providing further information on, um, on how fully vaccinated New Yorkers can interpret the guidance uh, for their day-to-day -day lives. Um, but basically, uh, so far, um, a person is considered fully vaccinated uh, 
two weeks after the second dose of Moderna Pfizer or two weeks after the uh, single dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, and um, looks like they can visit with other fully vaccinated people indoors uh, without masks or physical distancing, um, visit with um, unvaccinated people from a single household who are at low risk without masks or distancing. Uh, people should uh, discuss with their provider if they have any questions about their individual situation, um, because, um, you know, anyone like the immunocompromising conditions or other concerns. Uh, so we want to make sure um, folk are still in contact with their uh, PCPs and health providers. Um, but again, we await additional guidance from the state regarding quarantine for fully vaccinated people. And um, I um, want to emphasize still that anyone that is uh, fully vaccinated is still continuing wearing a, a mask and practice physical distancing and following all these other precautions when in public or with people uh, from multiple households um, or un un unvaccinated people who are at least um, at an increased risk of COVID-19. And um, more information can be found on CDC and uh, Department of Health website as we get that. And I can pass it over to our agency uh, partners here to help answer with that uh, looks like for you guys. Would any of the other agencies like to add anything? Okay. We also have a question um, about home-based nail and hair salons. Um, so many entrepreneurs and business owners have pivoted and there, um, there's a question about whether they um, can seek financial assistance and consultation during the this um, time of COVID new COVID regulations. And um, some of these salons are sole proprietors and there's a question about whether there's any specific regulation related to these home-based businesses. Sure, um, I can take that one. Um, yes, uh, in terms of financial assistance, there is uh, are programs that are available uh, for sole proprietors um, specifically um, the Paycheck Protection Program just um, made some changes to um, uh, access more sole proprietors, um, and I, I believe um, open to eligibility for um, potentially more funds. Um, so I would encourage you to, um, if you're interested in the Paycheck Protection Program, um, visit nyc.gov slash PPP. Um, we have daily webinars that you can join um, to ask any questions and learn more. Um, about what's available um, through the Paycheck Protection Program for sole proprietors, um, and then any other programs for financial assistance. Uh, if you go to nyc.gov slash financing assistance, um, there are representatives who, who could talk to you um, more uh, about those options. Um, if, if Berth is still on, I'll, I'll ask her about um, any compliance sessions for uh, sole proprietors or home-based businesses. Arthur, are you still here? Great. Hi, everyone. Um, unfortunately, the compliance advisor team, we don't visit home-based businesses, but as a hair salon, uh, I would navigate you to the Department of Consumer Affairs and Worker Protection website. Make sure that you're following all their rules and regulations, especially on pricing and safety. Uh, DCWP is very good at having a checklist for all businesses that are under them. So definitely visit them. Definitely visit all the the rules and regulations we talked about during COVID on the 4.ny.gov web, website to make sure that you're up to date with these COVID regulations and then just always keep safe, always keep safe. And especially for now, you said that you're mostly thinking of hair and personal care, but if you ever move into like piercings or tattoos, that would be the Department of Health. So always reach out and always navigate the city regulations as best as you can. Thank you, SBS. Um, there's another question about whether this video is available for future viewing. Of course it is. Please follow Queens Bar Presence Office on YouTube and we will be, um, most of our town halls and our events will be on, on that channel. So please follow and then you could also hit the bell and you'll know when um, there's a live event and it will alert you uh, going forward. So please join and subscribe there. Um, I'd like to stay with um, SBS for a little bit. They, um, you, you know, there were a number of fires throughout Queens, three in Flushing. This 
uh, recent week at, uh, week in Jackson Heights and a question um, uh, regarding those businesses that may not have insurance um, and whether uh, SBS uh, steps in and what sort of assistance and relief uh, do they provide for the businesses that may be um, existing on subleases and they may not have direct um, insurance um, coverage uh, what what goes into action there for those business owners. Sorry, I tried to unmute. Um, we do have um, an emergency response unit. As you mentioned, Bernadette Nation is um, a rock star. So um, definitely encourage all businesses that may have been impacted by that fire to reach out to Burns team um, and she can walk you through um, any of the questions and navigating any of the very complex um, processes that you may need to go through um, in order to recover. Um, I will drop um, in the chat how to access that team. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, also, we have a question specifically about pet care business businesses and how they're managed right now um, during this time. Sorry, so what, what exactly is the question about pet care? Um, doggy daycare and whether those businesses can, um, whether they work with DOH or DWP, sort of how do they go through their regulatory and approval process? I can take, you. Yeah, Excellent. I can take that question. Um, pet businesses are under the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, under the Bureau of Veterinary Care. Um, they might be able to open during this time because personal care was able to open during phase three. I would, the best, your best bet is to call the hotline so that we could gain the information to, for you to call them. Or if you already permitted business, just call DOH directly. Just like we said before, the hotline number is 888-SBS-4NYC. That's 888-727-4692. But yes, the, all pet care or animal-related businesses are under the Department of Health, the Bureau of Veterinary Care. Thank you for that. Um, okay, another question regarding, we've seen um, proliferation of the heating pods. And I think this is a question for DOT and FDNY on whether um, there is any clarity on guidance on the on best practices for use of these pods. And um, I, you know, we expect that we might see the program continue and just wanted to know if you had any specific updates regarding the use of these pods. Yeah, so um, I can speak a little to that. So with regard to the pods, they are, um, because because they're fully enclosed, they would be considered uh, indoor dining, so to say. Oftentimes, at least, and, and I've dined in them myself. You know, where where you have uh, the pod, it's just for maybe one table um, or you know for one party that comes in together. Um, so so that's that's fine. Um, you know, otherwise, at least for the open restaurant program, we do require for for larger setups where multiple parties are being seated. Uh, that there are at least two sidewalls open to allow for free air to flow. Otherwise, any anything more than that, so three or more sides fully closed, then you would you would have to adhere to indoor dining uh, capacity rules. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that percent is now. I know that that's been changing recently too. So, but um, yeah, I, I hope that that answers the question. I think so. Anything else to add from FDNY there? Um, no, the, the, just the main thing with, with uh, you know, with propane heating, uh, it's not meant to be inside uh, any structure. It's supposed to be uh, out, outdoors so that uh, the, the, the poisonous gases, carbon monoxide, can vent and, and not uh, be contained within a, within a structure, either a tent or uh, also the flammability of the tent uh, with, with uh, the propane heating, that, that's an issue. So uh, propane is, heating is meant to be exclusively outdoors, not, not contained. All right, thank you for your guidance on that. 
Um, we have a question now about food trucks and, um, you know, some are parked um, in front of brick and mortar stores and uh, sometimes all day. We're um, curious as to whether there will be enforcement of um, cur curbside parking rules um, or any enforcement from the Department of um, Health and Mental Hygiene during this time. So for anyone um, that wants to uh, have a check out any of the um, uh, mobile food vending units, um, you can uh, put it in through 311 and we are um, from a limited capacity uh, staffing, but we are uh, checking them out and uh, getting to the 311 complaints. Um, but um, I don't know if NGCWP wants to um, take this question on as well. Uh, yes, so that's uh, under uh, DOH MAGE uh, enforcement. Uh, we can um, actually um, present uh, to local law 18 of 2021, the mayor uh, designated to the Office of Street Vending Enforcement to DCWP, but that's for general vending. Uh, and uh, just to give you a little update on that, um, it, I mean, um, we will uh, have a period period of compliance and education outreach to vendors, and um, in the uh, coming weeks um, or the coming months, it will be uh, doing enforcement. But we are in a period of transition and education to vendors, street vendors, or general vend vendors. That would be the the term. Is there, um, so the, it's it's the general, is there a direct contact person regarding this or do you're saying it's a general number? It, they can call 311 to, mm -hmm. um, to complain, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, and we, we would love to um, partner with you on the education side of, um, that you're working on there. So uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, um, we have um, another question regarding um, assistance to small property owners who are struggling to pay taxes and other property related expenses. Sorry, I keep losing my unmute button. Um, uh, yeah, I, uh, we are working with, um, you know, with the state on um, relief there. Um, but in the meantime, um, I would direct you to our business solution centers um, to talk through any financial assistance options that are available. Um, NYC.gov slash financing assistance. Um, uh, they, um, you know, can talk you through um, potential opportunities. Okay, we look forward to learning more about that. Thank you. Um, okay, we, there's a, a few questions regarding violations and penalties. So um, is there a plan for health, DOB, DOT, to uh, the inspectors to issue warnings on the first visit to businesses before uh, violations are issued? Yeah, so I, I can speak at least to the DOT piece of that. So um, when we have an inspector visit a location, it can be done from a complaint or it could be proactive that sometimes we're just, the inspectors are just walking up and down um, commercial corridors and inspecting any structures that, or any outdoor dining setups that they're uh, seeing. And if, the, if it's found to not be in compliance, depending on what it is, if it's something very minor that can be fixed right there on the spot, oftentimes the inspector will we'll speak with a staff member and just say, hey, can you correct this right now? And, and that'll be you know, pretty simple. But um, if it's something a little different, might take a little time to correct, they will issue a 20, it's a 24 hour uh, correction notice. Um, and I'll just be, be frank that, you know, it's not, we don't necessarily follow up on that 25th hour, um, but it, it, we do follow up at some point within a couple of days for another inspection. Um, and if, that's not corrected, then you may be issued what we call a, a cease and desist, which is a little more, um, I guess, forceful in language uh, about, you know, that you must suspend your operations. But even if you were to receive that, that's kind of like a second warning. 
we still want restaurants to succeed here. We still want to make it work for everybody. Um, so in that case, if you do still make the corrections, sometimes we understand it takes time um, because, you know, you might need to order new materials and things like that. That is OK. As long as you resubmit uh, photos, basically appealing that um, and it's good to go, then you will be permitted to operate again. And there's no fine associated with with a DOT uh, warning or cease and desist. So take it um, to take it to an, an, a next level here and another step forward. Um, there's questions about uh, there are questions about waiving the penalties altogether for sanitation, health, transportation, consumer affairs, noise control, and building violations. Um, is there a new law that on um, waiving these violations, um, is that being considered? And if so, when do you expect that could go into effect for any of these? In terms of uh, legislation, I, I wouldn't be able to, to speak to that. I'm not familiar. Um, but what I do know is as the open restaurant program becomes permanent, um, these are the types of things that, that are to be considered because you know, COVID or not, uh, if, if open restaurants are here to stay, um, it will have to be a little more formalized, um, you know, for, for years to come. So uh, it sounds like more, more info will be needed on that um, going forward. All right, thank you. We'll also uh, monitor that from a legislative um, perspective. There's also a, a question that's come in about construction related industries. Are there, is there any new compliance specific to this industry that anyone is aware of? Birth, can you talk on um, any of the uh, specific rules and regulations for construction? Yes, um, construction was a part of phase one. They, there hasn't been any new updates, uh, but the best place to get the updates is on forward.ny.gov. They're one of the first businesses that were opened and it seems to be exactly the same as before. Just follow the rules and regulations and just wait for whenever vaccinations would be ready for construction workers. Thank you, thank you, Bertha. Appreciate that. There are a few questions that also have come in about applications and not specific to which application. Um, so if um, Nizmoon, you can, be more specific with that. Um, but I also know that in the chat, if you open up in the chat for those who are on Zoom, you will see a number of links there. And hopefully you can find the links to the application um, in that chat. Um, there are um, some questions about uh, um, garbage removal. Uh, we do get these questions from time to time coming into this office as well from various uh, merchants groups and, and uh, business districts and wondering um, how can we uh, get relief and who should we call for when there is uh, garbage that's not picked up in these, in these districts? I can touch on that a little. Um, so, you know, with regard to um, the outdoor dining or even um, and I, I realize I didn't touch too much on it. Uh, open storefronts um, initiative. You know, if there is trash, I know that a, the respective business is responsible to keep their space uh, clean. Um, and you know, I'm not too familiar with with Department of Sanitation's uh, policies, but they would be um, in the enforcement agency um, with with regard to that. All right, thank you for that. Um, so there's a question specifically about uh, NYC Business Solution Centers and who would be the best legal contact there? Uh, 
Uh, sure. So um, if you, um, there's a, a form um, on our website, nyc.gov slash SBS. Um, you can contact one of our business solution centers uh, through that uh, contact form. Um, and if you just um, note that you're looking for legal services, uh, a representative will follow up with you to learn a little bit more about, um, uh, you know, what your needs are and um, connect you to pro bono legal assistance um, uh, as applicable. So again, that website is nyc.gov slash SBS. Thank you. Um, another question um, for about businesses um, being able to access um, capital and grant funding. Are there any plans in the upcoming budget for grant funding for small businesses from the city? Yeah, so definitely, um, you know, stay up to date um, if you join our mailing list. Um, Again, if you go to nyc.gov slash SBS, um, uh, definitely encourage you to um, join our mailing list so you uh, receive updates on any new programs or um, you know, loan programs, grant programs. Um, I think we're still reviewing um, you know, what uh, was just passed in the new stimulus. Um, uh, the mayor did announce in the state of the city, we will be um, creating a new loan fund for New York City businesses. Um, more to come on what, um, you know, exactly eligibility will be and, and what that program looks like. But um, please, um, you know, stay up to date um, with, with our agency to, to keep, um, keep up to speed of, of what's available for you. Thank you. And I know we're all keeping an eye on the new federal bill that came down. So um, looking to see, you know, what sort of relief comes out of that specifically to New York City and Queens. Um, we have a, a question regarding um, discretion on enforcement um, as it relates to uh, state liquor authority, social distancing, and impounding of vehicles. And this is for the sheriff's office, but anybody um, that has any information on any of these three categories, please feel free. I'm not sure if the sheriff is um, still on the line. All right, um, so no comments at this time on um, enforcement of SLA and vehicles. Okay. All right, and, and I, I, I do think that this has been just, you know, really incredible to get um, the firsthand um, information from you all. And I, I expect that this could be something that we will do again coming out of uh, this office in partnership with SBS and, and your agencies. Um, and we do we did request for SLA to join this time and we're hoping that next time they will be able to and we'll be able to get more questions because I, <laughs> I know there are a lot of questions for our, especially for our um, restaurants and um, entertainment um, businesses in um, here in Queens. So I think that we've um, gone through most of the questions. I think uh, Lenore has one question about the PPP uh, loan application and whether um, if you're denied once, whether there's, uh, you may be able, a business may be able to apply with a different lender a second time. Um, and I'm not sure if anybody has experience working with businesses that were able to maybe get it the second time around. Yeah. Um, I. I would, um, I, I would like to, I can follow up with you, um, Lenore, on that question. I would want to check in with our financial assistance team. Um, you can also reach out to nyc.gov slash PPP um, uh, or our hotline um, could also probably help you answer that question, but um, I will look into it and um, make sure um, uh, I try to get your contact information after this to um, follow up with you on that. Thank you, Meredith. Appreciate that. And so I'd like to um, just say also uh, thank you to Sharon Anderson, for, um, who's our Director of Economic Development. Uh, John Paracone is our Business Ombudsman. He's also on the line. 
And I know that they've been working um, tirelessly for our small businesses. I'm a former bid director myself, so I cannot thank you all enough um, for being here and everything that you're doing. Um, we are beginning to see a rebound. Um, I'm excited that we have our restaurants opening soon at 50%. And, um, and you know, it's, uh, you know, I guess a, about a year into the pandemic. And so um, we're, I think this is a really um, critical time that, you know, we tried our best to, to get our businesses to uh, reopen as, as soon as possible. A year is a long time um, to be, you know, going through this type of hardship. So I really appreciate the extra push as I said, I know you all are literally 24-7. Um, uh, every time we reach out, we are just, you know, so grateful for you being so responsive to us and to the businesses that reach out to us. And so look forward to a continued partnership. Um, we are going to definitely uh, have this on YouTube for those who missed part of this. But um, if there are no more questions, we can um, call adjournment now, unless anyone has any final questions remarks or greetings from their agencies? Um, I actually, I got the answer um, for Lenore. I was typing it, but other people might have the same question. Awesome. So uh, I'll, I'll answer it live. Um, uh, you can um, apply again for the second round of PPP if you were denied the first time. Um, you can use the same lender or a different lender. Um, there might be reasons that you may not have been eligible the first time around, um, but there have been changes, so you might be eligible this time around. Um, if you are looking for a new lender, you can find uh, a list of lenders at nyc.gov slash PPP. Um, and if you have questions about um, a reapplication, um, feel free to um, go to that website and access one of our representatives who can help answer any questions um, if you reapply the second time around. Thank you. See what I mean? <laughs> you guys have been so great. Um, and I have to tell you, I have to listen to this again too. There was so much information that came in and um, I encourage you all to, to do that. Um, the, the question about the construction, it was answered um, and, and we can definitely put you, Sylvia, directly in touch with, um, with SBS on, on anything there. And um, so I'd like to, oh, one more question has just come in. Um, Okay, great. It's a comment that that there's again there's so many direct uh, bid directors, community leaders, faith leaders on here that they're going to be sharing this information with um, you know th throughout um, their stakeholders as well. And so, I think that we had a great session, and appreciate you all, and wishing you all 